large organizations are global in nature. Um, the things that I find amazing about them is they're all driven by deep, deep expertise. These are really, really smart people. They're incredibly curious. Interestingly, they follow the data. They don't trust their instincts. They follow the, they're incredibly curious about data. And they're passionate about, but they're passionate about their vision. They know where they want to be. They always have clear aim on the cap in which they're going. They're relentless at it. They're incredibly demanding. Um, they're incredibly demanding, and yet they're amazingly respectful. Like, it was, it's not easy to work for Larry and Sergey and Eric. It's not easy to work for Jack. It really isn't. But they're very respectful. They will take the time to listen to your arguments. And if you have the data on your side, they will tip over, which is an amazing, uh, amazing set of characters. They're also, in my case, and it's probably because of uh, who I am, they're just a lot, if, if you're core, they're very quirky, right? So if you're quirky, it's totally okay. And I'm very quirky, I know I am. So for me, it's like, okay, we're all quirky, life is good, let's go keep on going. But you have to be able to live with this weird quirkiness, passion, relentlessness of it, and just drive that's just amazing mm -hmm. and hyper smart. So you need to think about it before you say something. Mm -hmm. So one of our core values is actually true north, which is maybe because we're Canadian, but we call it alignment for the long-term vision. And it's looking at data to find the truth that will allow us to achieve the vision. Yeah. Uh, but we find culturally that's something that we want to emphasize. Um, but definitely different if you don't have the mechanisms in place in order it to enable essentially your whole team to have access to that data. Um, and I just spent the weekend with Rob Williams, who's on the Lightspeed board with you, who was at Amazon for 10 years in leadership there. And he told me that the secret to Amazon and what Jeff did was not about creating new products or, or, or strategies. It was about ensuring the mechanics of decision making get decentralized so people at the ground level um, can follow the vision with the data. Um, what type of mechanics did, did you see at Google or did you, would you recommend to a business to enable that data-driven culture? I think um, this is a really, really important point. I agree with Rob. I think that Google was a bit more centralized. I think Larry and Sergey wanted to control a lot more of the product. Having said that, they had their second layer of trusted people. And if those people said yes or no, um, then they would typically acquiesce. The fundamental issue, I think, that people don't do enough, you never do enough, is fast cycle, get the data, what did we learn this week? Get the data, what did, like, we, our cycle times are too long to ask ourselves, what did we learn this week? What did we learn this month? What, because in essence, y that's where the opportunity is. It's an always refining. And I can tell you at Google in search, the amount, I mean, we had a lot of capacity, but we would do thousands of experiments. Not tens of experiments, thousands of experiments. We would change the shade of a blue color to 1,000 different shades of blue to see do we see any difference and then cross-correlate with a million other things. We did a lot of experiments and we listened to the data and we changed it all the time. And I think people wait too long because it's, it's in the question, what have we learned? If you've learned nothing, then everybody's kind of like, all right, <laughs> I think we have a problem here, right? Like, if you're not a learning organization, you're going to get chewed up by somebody else. So I think for many people here, the issue is risk within their organization. So um, people might fear that if they take the risk and it fails, then they won't get promoted or they're, they're, they'll get fired. Um, how do you, how would you kind of give advice to someone who's in an organization that maybe doesn't explicitly reward risk? How, how would you kind of encourage that? Um, you, you um, well, there's two ways to do it. There's the covert way where you basically kind of hide a little bit of budget, you don't tell anybody and you go and do it and then you come back and say, ah, oh, I've done it. <laughs> and then uh, I've done that many times, I don't recommend it, but it works actually really well. If you're kind of, if you really want to make a point, you're God dotted about it and you're going to say, no, no, I'm going to show you, buddy. Um, and it works. So that's one way. 
the preferred way is um, in many cases, the, the trick is to actually, people wait too long to learn. And so they, they say, I need six months. And then I can show you blah, blah, blah. The question is, why can you show in six weeks? And if you can have these many fast cycles, you have a lot more data. And with a lot more data, you can hone down much faster. And if you can hunt, and so you need smaller groups maybe, or you need, you know, y the trick is to actually take the risk out of. And the great thing about software and, and, and sales is that it doesn't take much to test. So you don't, before you kind of reorganize everything, which is usually the typical of large organizations, just set yourself a SWAT team that actually, and it's got a license to kill to try stuff. And you tell everybody, we're gonna try stuff. And we're gonna have oops, but we're gonna have oops on 30 people, not 400,000 people. And that's okay. And, and if everybody gives you that license to do that and you do s fast cycles, you will actually end up with the right answer pretty fast. And people will give you the license because they don't perceive risk. You just gotta take it off. You know, your boss, you know, she or he, you know, they, they work really hard to be the, your boss. So now they don't wanna lose their status. And, and so y y your job is to make them look good. Make them look good. And the way you make them look good is you, take, you tell them there's no risk. And then you basically <laughs> tune it down. And that's how it actually <laughs> works. That's the way the I love everyone. I hope, I hope you took notes on that. Everybody works that way, right? And then once in a while, you yeah. have to ask for forgiveness. And that's totally okay if you actually judge the <laughs> risk properly. And if you don't do enough of that, then, you know, you're not pushing the envelope far enough. I mean, we've had, I'd Google, I, I can't tell you how many times we've asked for forgiveness. <laughs> <laughs> People say, oh, well, we have good news and bad news. <laughs> I was like, okay, bring it on. And I was like, okay. I mean, you prefer that than people, again, going back to my five nines, right? Yep, it's five nines, but it's not moving. Yeah. When we look at headlines these days, though, you know, people uh, in the media, they, they make these crazy failure stories. So Google Plus or the Amazon phone, they, they, they screwed it up. Um, and, and I'm sure like a lot of organizations that we work with, we're, we're trying, we're experimenting, we're failing, but the failures seem to be dramatized and magnetized, whereas the successes or the wins remain silent. Uh, well, I mean, it's a bit the same story as customer service, right? You have a great service uh, exper experience and then you'll get three people, but if you have a shitty one, you get 25, right? Um, you tell it, and I wouldn't worry about that too much in the sense that journalists are there to earn a living by making headlines. And so if they can make like, oh my God, Google Plus was a disaster, they will make that because that's what sells their stuff. I do think that um, there is, in those two examples, there's a great insight which we've fallen into occasionally at Google and for tech companies that are on a fast pace, often fall into is what I call chasing tail lights. I think we fell in that trap with, with Google Plus, definitely. We saw social and we said we need a response to social and now you're chasing tail lights and you never catch up. That's a strategic mistake that we've done. It wasn't very costly so it wasn't the end of the world but had we, had we been smarter about it, and our batting average is still phenomenal, so it doesn't, but these are the signs of nervousness, unnecessary nervousness in an organization. And I wouldn't worry about those. I think that what's more important for you is don't chase taillights. Find your own field, set up the field the way you want to win, and go at it. Don't go and play on somebody else's field. So you talk about this go at it, you talk about persistence, you talk about things starting small and getting big. Um, what should people be looking for, like I I if they're paying attention to the data, what, what, what's that spark where you're like, wow, this could be the next Google, or this could be the next X? Like it starts with the product definition, because you have to, it comes back to TAM, right? Search, search is unbelievable. Everybody wants to search, and it's a never ending product. People, I, the, the s eight years I spent at Google, every year was a new frontier for search. Absolute new frontier. From, you don't remember, like you've forgotten, but when you started in 2006 and seven, and you had like three results, and then you had the texts, and today you ask, you know, how high is Everest? And it tells you, right, 29,843 feet. That because that's what you're looking for, and then it has entities, and 
And so I think that how you start with a product that has a huge addressable market, and that solves a real opportunity or a real problem for your customers, it just kind of <sighs> gives you oxygen. I was talking to somebody yesterday about uh, these jump bikes. Uh, I was in Paris. I go to Paris all. I live in London right now, so I go to Paris all the time for VC. And um, and so you go to pa Paris is a nightmare in a cab, and they have the little scooters which are like super dangerous, and but they have the jump bikes. And the jump bikes they're electric, so you never sweat even if it's 40 degrees outside, and um, and they go to A to B. And I'm a huge cyclist. Everybody should know. So I'm I'm born and raised on a bike. Like I can bike. Like I can bike better than I can walk. So for me, this jump bike, it's like, wow, one-tenth the price, five times faster. You got a smile on my face the whole way because now I'm freaking playing Super Mario Kart across Paris with my bike. <laughs> it's like, it solves a problem, right? I mean, now the question is, is it a big enough addressable market? But I can tell you, N equals one here, it's doing a great job. And, uh, and that's how you have to think about your products and your strategy. Go for Big Tam, go for Absolute, yeah, it nails it. One of the things that you said to us, uh, you know, as we kind of shared our TAM, and particularly in sharing our different customers, uh, whether it be a telecom or manufacturer, you look at the opportunity for them to drive third-party services or to build out their ecosystem or to become omni-channel. Uh, we're talking massive TAMs, um, but at the same time, one of the things you encourage us to say is actually like start small and make it repeatable, and then look at that data as it gets big. So how do you balance that, like? big TAM potential, because I think any of our customers could, would agree, anyone in this room would say, my TAM can be massive on page. If I can capture even 5% of my customer base, that's tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in value. Yeah. But how do I get there within three years before my executives kill it? Yeah, and I, I so look, go back to the telco argument for a minute. Like, if you're at Bell and you're serving all these small, medium businesses, you have connectivity. So you have their trust. And the question is, don't try to go and sell them a package of, I don't know, deep data analytics of something, something of, but you know, you've probably earned their security. You've probably earned their office software suite. You even may have earned like, you know, their basic package for accounting. And if you're a small, medium business with three offices somewhere, you've probably earned that trust. And you, if you have AppDirect to actually wrap that to say, hey, Here's, here's how I can help. And by the way, you have one throat to choke. It's going to work. It's going to work seamlessly. And then there's all this other stuff, but that's for tomorrow, right? And earn that trust. That's a much easier sell to me. If I was, I remember my days at s selling SMB at Bell, I could sell that. I could sell that easily. And, and then a couple of upgrades of this and that and the other. And then now, you just run the tape for the next 10 years. Now I go, okay, my accounting works, and now how about your work scheduling, and how about this, and how about that? And uh, now you can talk about, you know, how about you, I, have you ever thought of analytics? Because I'm learning to run, right? But first you learn to walk, and that's a huge TAM. These are, I mean, huge bases of customers, and they're looking for simplicity. They're completely confused. And so there's a great example of, hey, you know, that's what I meant by recognize the entire envelope be very focused on just nailing the real adjacencies that give you the right to grow into them. It's amazing, and it's so aligned with our digital transformation value framework and what we've found in terms of the successes, which is just like a cell that starts small with one thing and then replicates and gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and uh, you know, like Warren Buffett's snowball effect. And, uh, and I think just looking at those data, iterating is, is gonna Same be- Same point, I mean, we talked about cars, you and I earlier, mm -hmm. right? Figure out the dashboard. Don't figure out the ABS, right? Don't try to sell the ABS at first. <laughs> like, that's a critical mission, you know. But the dashboard with all of my, so if I have Android or Apple or I have this or I have that, and that all works seamlessly and it's super simple. And if I want to add two, three ad apps that are really close to my heart and I can see them, and that's the way you enter in a car. Mm -hmm. But man, there's a ton of technology in a car, and that's a huge opportunity as well. It's amazing. So tomorrow, we're going to be talking about digital heroes and honoring the digital heroes amongst the community. I think you exemplify that. I know you exemplify that. Um, but beyond, um, obviously, your pursuits such as uh, biking and traveling and running big incumbents like Bell and innovators like Google and finding time to go to Burning Man, um, you also um, really are passionate about certain causes and particularly um, Nature Conservatory. Can you speak a little bit to Canuck and what you're doing? Yeah, so my, now that I'm AK after kids, instead of 
So we had BK, then we had K, now we're at AK. And um, you still write the checks, by the way, but at least they're not like opening the fridge. It's really cool. My, <laughs> my son works, my son lives in San Francisco, and I have this, because I go to San Francisco all the time. It's so cool. I have this great moment. I walk into his house. He's sitting there. I don't even talk to him. I go straight for the fridge. I open it. I take the carton, and I drink out of it. <laughs> 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 it's payback time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's like, uh, hi, Dad. <laughs> um, I divide now my life into three buckets. I have my work with Inovia, and it's essentially working with Chris, Dennis, the entire team. And my work is really simple. I mean, uh, my objective is to build the next 30,000 jobs in Canada, tech jobs, find the companies that have the audacity to build these jobs, people like you, and, and, um, and, and so that, because at the heart of it, we're lucky, we won, if you're, if you're Canadian, you won the lot, I can tell you, I've traveled the entire world and I slept everywhere in the world for two and a half years, and finally out of the Hiltons in the club sandwich land. And we are so amazingly lucky to be born Canadian. Like, you just don't know how lucky we are. And so for me, the next 30,000 jobs matter because that's what enables us to continue to live the infrastructure that we have in Canada that gives us a quality of opportunity and be the place that the whole world wants to come and live. So I've pegged 30,000, after that I'll figure it out, maybe 50, but that matters to me. So that's my first job. My second job is in the philanthropic endeavors, which I have too. I have a long-term project with Canuck. We purchased a, cu a couple families, got together six years ago. We purchased the of the Chateau Montebello. So that's just west of Montreal. 65,000 acres of virgin land. We're the fourth owner in 400 years. Monseigneur Laval was given this land by the King of France, Louis XIV. Louis Joseph Papineau, Rebellion of 1837. CPR, buried in the books of the CPR for nearly 100 years. They used it as a private club for the board. It was put up for sale to developers uh, six years ago, 30 lakes, untouched land. So four Canadian families and Nature Conservancy made a Hail Mary bid to buy it, and we purchased it. And so now we're basically... <laughs> we've opened it as a pourvoirie. You can rent cottages, you can go fishing. Um, yeah, can you exactly. go canoeing? We got can you, you uh, there you a go. Canuck paddle. Canuck. There With you go. direct on the back, too. Ah, oh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's my 250-year project. And then on a day-to-day -day basis, I work with amazing doctors to cure cataract blindness around the world in the poorest areas of the world, the poorest of the poor. I think people, independent of this long-term project, uh, we say in French, faut payer le pain fil uh, So it's about really giving sight back. For 20 bucks, you can take somebody who's blind, giving them sight back. With their sight, they have their dignity. You pull them out of poverty for 20 bucks. So we raise money, we're building hospitals around the world, and we're giving people back their dignity every day. So that's my second thing. And then the last one is adventures, <laughs> and that's going to continue. It's amazing. And um, just for everyone so they can see it, because I saw how inspiring the, the story about uh, curing blindness in Everest. What's the name of the book? Have you um, Second Sons is a book that will give you, it's a Himalayan cataract project. It is an unbelievable story of resilience. Dr. Ruit and Dr. Tabin, uh, it is, it is, it's a super easy read. It will give you a sense of whenever you feel that you're doing good things in the world, you read that book and then you kind of go take a cold shower. Um, th these are people that have inspired me amazingly and uh, so I continue to support them. I encourage you to support them as well. Um, and, um, and, 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 uh, it is, yeah, so that's basically what I set my time with now. It's amazing. Well, a true digital hero, please join me in thanking Patrick Pichet. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Patrick. Amazing. Thank you. Fun. Thank you. That was right. <laughs>